I want to begin by thanking you all for all that you do. We really rely on you to teach the next generation of economists. Our society needs people who understand at least some economics, even if they're not going to be professional economists. I think the society is going to be, is, is, works better if uh, most people understand at least some economics. And that's because most of the problems that we face benefit from uh, bringing an economic lens to them. So thank you for what you do. And I hope our uh, small contribution today helps you do your job that uh, just a bit more effectively. I know firsthand the power that a great teacher can have. Uh, I uh, started my interest in economics in year 11. That was really because of a, a fantastic teacher I had in uh, where I went to school in, in Wagga Wagga. Uh, back in the late 1970s, when I was studying economics, you could actually study three unit economics or advanced economics. Unfortunately, uh, you can't do that anymore, but I benefited from that. I really remember being intrigued by the problem of welfare maximization. The idea that if you did things properly, you could get the biggest economic pie. And through some combination of the price mechanism and government regulation, that society could allocate that pie to its maximum advantage. So maximizing the size of the pie and allocating the pie to its maximum advantage as a teenager, I found those really powerful ideas and I wanted to know uh, more about how it worked. The teacher that I had in year 11 and 12 did a fantastic job in showing how economics was relevant to our lives. And she, she really made it very clear how economic knowledge could be used to make the world a better place. So I was uh, so intrigued by those ideas that I ended up studying eight years of economics at university for the uh, University of New South Wales here in Sydney and then for overseas. Uh, this passion really started from having a fantastic teacher who was able to share her passion with her students and inspire people to study economics. So, I think you're doing a, a fantastic job in, in inspiring the next generation. I really encourage you to keep uh, that up. Today, uh, you're going to hear from my colleagues about current economic issues the Reserve Bank is grappling with. They include the resurgence of inflation globally, unconventional monetary policy and how it works and how it might eventually end. What does full employment mean in our modern economy with flexible work practices? And what is the impact of climate change on our economy and our financial system? They're all important questions for our society. And I hope that uh, you also touch on these questions in your classrooms and what you hear today will help you in the classroom. I imagine how you teach monetary policies changed a lot over the years. Probably wasn't that long ago that you were teaching about open market operations, the Reserve Bank would buy and sell government bonds to control the money supply and by controlling the money supply to control output and inflation. More recently though, you would have been teaching about how we move the cash rate and, and open market operations are, are, are not that important anymore. And then probably over the last year or so, you've been teaching about a bond purchase program, the yield target, term funding facility, and perhaps the lower bound on interest rates, the zero lower bound. So it's become a more complicated world for us. And uh, I know it's become a more complicated world for you and you've had to deal with these complications, uh, uh, teaching online a lot of the time. I have a son in year 12 who's had to manage uh, online learning. Unfortunately, he didn't study economics, but uh, I know the challenges of online learning for a bit for senior students. So while uh, what you've taught about monetary policy has changed over time, one thing that hasn't changed are the objectives of the RBA. They were set out in legislation back in 1959 and we're one of the few central banks that have had our objectives um, uh, unchanged for a long period of time. I hope you know those objectives are price stability, full employment, and the economic welfare of the Australian people. 
I uh, really like this third objective because it links back to what I learned back in high school in 1979, and that is that the job of economics is to maximise the collective welfare of the society in which we live. And uh, we're a bit unusual as a central bank in uh, having welfare maximisation as part of our legislative objective, but I'm uh, always uh, very proud to have that as part of our objectives and I talk about that frequently. I just want to say a few words about uh, one of these objectives that's been discussed a lot recently and that's inflation. Um, it's on my mind because I'm going to give a speech on this topic at uh, lunchtime today to the Australian business economists. For many years, really for the past two decades, inflation really hasn't been on people's radar screens. It's been kind of off on the margin somewhere. But in the last six months, inflation has once again moved to the centre of many people's radar screens. You might have seen just in the, in the US just recently, the inflation rate has um, increased to 6%, which is very high. And in many European countries, the inflation rate's above 4%. So there are significant concerns again about the re-emergence of inflation and the international meetings that I go to, that I participate in by Zoom late at night, the topic of inflation is now being discussed more than any others. And the, the issue uh, that uh, people are grappling with is whether the increase in inflation we're seeing now is transitory or it's persistent and after having had two decades of very low rates of inflation, uh, we're moving into a world where inflation is likely to be higher. So that's the question we're all grappling with at the moment. And it's hard to know the answer to that, but there's a fairly broad consensus that the pickup in inflation we're currently experiencing only, is only temporary. And I say that because the origin of the current increase in inflation is an unprecedented switch away from spending on services to spending on goods because of COVID-19. So instead of eating out and traveling and going to the gym, many of us have bought home office equipment or home exercise equipment, and we've taken to online shopping. So there's been an extraordinary increase in the demand for goods at the same time that demand for services collapsed. So the world wanted a lot more goods and the supply capacity for goods uh, was impaired because of all the restrictions of, of COVID-19. So demand goes up, supply contracts, what happens to price? I learned this back in high school, the price goes up and uh, that's what we're seeing right at the moment and all this pressure in, in the uh, goods markets have uh, caused problems in global supply chains as well, so you've probably heard about longer shipping times, longer waiting times, delays. Uh, so that's what's uh, been happening uh, over the past six months. And we can see it in the Australian CPI now at the price of cars rising at the fastest rate in 20 years and the price of electronics falling at the slowest rate in I think 30 years. So that's uh, what's been happening. The question we're now grappling with is whether consumption patterns will now normalise. Now that we can go out to restaurants again, just kind of globally, we can go out to restaurants and travel, uh, will services consumption start to rise strongly and a goods consumption normalise after having bought all that uh, home exercise equipment and home, home office equipment, well, the demand for those type of goods declines. So it's quite possible that we now see a normalisation of consumption patterns and that takes away a lot of the pressure on inflation. That's why people think that uh, this increase in inflation is likely to be only temporary because there'll be this normalisation of consumption patterns. The question we're grappling with here is if demand for services does pick up very strongly now, which I think is quite likely, how's the labour market going to respond? We see in the US that wages growth now is almost at 5% and in the UK it's at 4%. So what's been happening there is that uh, labour force participation has declined. 
know, with high rates of uh, COVID infections, people didn't want to work, they didn't want to uh, do face-to-face -face work. And so that a lot of people have withdrawn from the labour force. So now we've got strong demand for services. And at the same time, in some countries, reduced labour supply, and that's pushing up wages. In Australia, though, labour force participation is as high as it's ever been. So we're not seeing this um, shock to labour supply here. So that's uh, the issue that my colleagues internationally are grappling with as demand for services picks up. Are the workers going to be there? And if they're not, how's that going to transmit into wages and ultimately inflation? When I was doing HSC back in 1979, I was writing essays on stagflation, why we had low economic growth and high inflation at the same time. I'm not expecting, not hope, and I'm hoping that your students will have to write essays on that topic. I don't think it's likely, because I think the current burst in inflation will be only temporary. But it's possible that if we see very strong demand for services and uh, labour force participation remains weak, that we'll see a shifting in wage norms and higher inflation. And then the topic of stagflation might once again become popular. I don't think, and that's not my prediction, I don't think that's likely to happen, but it is something we're watching very carefully. 